doubling his position today in Uber ahead of today's open. Talk to us. Why? Yeah, so I, I had like kind of got into it a little bit noncommittally in, Dece- in the middle of December, just looking at, at, at a stock that had just been completely thrown in the trash. Something really revolutionary happened in, in, in the uh, tech space, the post-IPO space, sometime around last summer, where we basically said, you know what, we're not interested in these TAM stories anymore. Now it's about profitability. I obviously think Uber's IPO disappointment was part of that. And then, of course, what happened with WeWork. And what resulted with Uber is that people just stopped even talking about it or looking at it. In the meanwhile, the company had been making very good strides toward getting profitable um, and getting unit level economics, getting, getting scale but reasonable scale, and then looking at investments around the world that no longer made sense and walking away. So you saw them look at Eats and say, look, Eats is going to be a great business in America. It's already an amazing business in places like Australia. It's not going to be a good business in India. It will not be a good business in South Korea. And they did the mature thing. And they got out of those businesses. So you're seeing a management team that's balancing this idea of rapid growth, but growing responsibly and not just doing a vision fund. We're going to we're going to swallow up everything and figure out what it's worth later. So that's what I like about the setup here. So the stock's right now having its best day ever. Yeah. And it sounds like it was clearly the comment from Dara first on the call that they're going to be profitable uh, EBITDA profitable a year earlier than expected. Yeah. And then here's what he told Andrew Ross Sorkin in the exclusive interview this morning on Squawk Box. This is a business that, as it grows, can become quite profitable. And for 2020, we got together as a team and said, you know what, we can do the same thing, not just for the rides business, but for the whole business. So if you look at our plan for 2020, for every dollar of revenue growth, especially right. from Q4 to Q4, we expect to drop 50 cents to 55 cents to the bottom line. We think that's absolutely doable to get to profitability by Q4, but at the same time make the kinds of investments that we want to make. As I said, stock right now having yeah. its best day ever, highs of the day, and this was the tipping point for you to, to double down. So, so basically, uh, I think like a lot of people figure out about growth stocks, like one of the best things you can do is, is average up when you get confirmation of things that you thought were once possible. So I buy the stock in December. I say, all right, I don't know how things are going to go. They are losing a ton of money. Are they going to get to the point where they're responsible enough to show a pathway toward profitability? They say they are, but what's actually going to happen? When you get incremental proof that they are on that pathway, even if the stock is five or six points higher, that's when you want to add more because what you thought could go right starts to go right in reality. It's a very different mindset from a value investment where you say, well, it was at 20, now it's at 15, and if anything, the street is uh, even more missing, missing out on the upside. This is the opposite. This is like, yes, this is confirmation, and I'm investing this as a growth investor. The main thing that I want to say, though, about this um, being, being involved with the stock and buying it under 30, adding to it you know, closer to 39. The main thing here that I want to say is this is a company that legitimately has now a platform. It's dominant in the space. There aren't going to be new players that come along. We already went through that. There aren't going to be new Eats players either. We already went through that. So, like, the biggest worry about the company, too much competition ever to be profitable, That's now fading. And now the new question is, how much of the take rate can they get? Right now, they get 22% on average of an Uber ride, right? So, Scott, you go to an airport for $100, 22 of those dollars go to Uber. As autonomous becomes more and more realistic, and I'm talking a 10-year time horizon, that 22% migrates up toward 100%. There aren't any more drivers. So the bigger they get now, while you need drivers for the next five years, the more there is an opportunity in the future. That's what I mean by platform. So pr- price targets, yeah, I mean, there's like 10 price target bumps today from anywhere from 39 to 56. A yeah. Higher. Uh, well, Mahaney's in the 60s. Where, where do you think the stock can I th- legitimately I, I, go? I, I, I think from these levels it could be 50 bucks. By the end I mean, of the year? Any, we, we know we watched Tesla last late week. We know that really anything on earth is possible. But I'm just saying, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not looking for that. I'm just saying this, this could and should be a $50 stock if – if they continue to execute the way they did this quarter throughout the rest of this year, which, of course, is not 
a fait accompli. We'll have to see if that happens. Mid-2019, you bought it, and you didn't hold it all that long. No, and I think it's uh, a broader IPO conversation. But first, let me just address uh, Uber and why I like uh, Josh's buy. I think when you're looking at this company, first of all, understand the backdrop for the consumer is a very strong one. It's a resilient consumer. The consumer demand is there. I thought what Dara emphasized it, which was very important, is he's got pricing power. If you think about some of the initiatives that he is adopting in California where he faces uh, the legislation challenges, that's where the pricing was actually strongest. They're reducing incentives, um, they're raising prices, and the consumer is still there. So I think you're finally seeing for this company uh, that turn not only towards profitability, but the ability that their pricing is there. As it relates to IPOs, there was in the third quarter of 2019, unquestionably, this sentiment that you just did not want to be there. And one of the things is the calendar year approach 2020, we talked about, I remember at the New York Stock Exchange having this conversation, is the last place that this liquidity was going to go after was the IPOs. And there are several names, obviously, that I've gotten into and I've talked about, that being Slack and uh, Zoom video. Um, but the IPOs are an investable, once again, I would argue the best one of the best holdings I have is a 2018 IPO, which is DocuSign, which is uh, pressing to all-time highs right now. And let's not forget, and we'll talk about a little bit more, Pinterest. Pinterest, that quarter was fantastic. I would make the argument that from a social media platform, there is more value in Pinterest than there is in Snap because of the broader reach. Why nobody else on, on Uber? Farmer Jim? Well, I, P.E. ratio is very high right now. It's no, infinity. But, but, look, I'm not going to sit here and say it's, it's egregiously priced. I mean, I look at it and I see it's roughly four times this year's sales, maybe even a little bit lower depending on whose uh, estimate you use. Look, I do like to have earnings, so that's just why it's kind of outside of my, my realm. But I don't look at this and say, oh, this is similar to Tesla or this is similar to a Roku or something like that. I, I think that when you have four times, uh, roughly four times sales and you start to look at profitability, you start to think about operating margins, and you can see that the earnings multiple one, two years out is not going to be egregious at this price level. It's just I don't have that crystal ball, that crystal much of a view on what those earnings are going to yeah, be. That's what keeps me You out. don't necessarily have to because Dara helped you get a little more clarity in the, the roadmap, if you will, to profitability. That's the sort of game changer that I feel like Josh has made a move on. Well, I think the enthusiasm around the transparency and that is really in sharp ju juxtaposition to Tesla. Uh, if you think about governance and, and a management team that's providing clear transparency on what the expectations are for the next couple of years, if you go back to the fourth quarter, it was, to Jim's point, it was trading at three times revenue. That would, that's, a, that's an amazing entry point given the fact that, you know, as Josh said, you've, you've, you've seen this story improve. I think for us, we want to see positive free cash flow, and, we're, and that's a requirement for us, and so we're not going to see that for a while, but I definitely, you know, I don't think that this is something that is in the same camp as what we've seen in Tesla over the last couple of weeks, uh, especially on the management side. Put a quick button on this, and I want to move on to another big story today. So I would just say uh, the Eats business, which people were really excited about a year, a year and a half ago before the IPO, is growing 44 percent. And so there was so much commentary about there's, there's so much competition there. You will see the weaker competitors fall away. They could end up with a little bit more pricing power there. They've signed 400,000 restaurants in one year, many independents and many massive chains. That is a trend that will continue. And it's not just U.S., it's global. So if, if there really is upside here, it's not going to be about do they get an extra dollar versus Lyft. It's going to be about is this more than rides? Is Eats profitable? Is freight something that can grow beyond the 1% of the business currently is? And if that's the case, then to me, I feel like you're looking at a platform a la Google um, that, that could be much more than just, hey, I need an Uber to get me somewhere uh, later today. It's more than taxis if all of this stuff falls into place. So right, we'll, I'm willing to bet that it might. We'll continue to watch the stock. We said best day ever right now. Had to be up greater than eight and a quarter percent and now firmly as you can see as Josh was discussing it here let's call it a 10 percent move a 10 percent gain today uh, in shares of Uber elsewhere we're dealing with a market that's reacting to a jobs report you could see stocks are giving a little bit back today um, is it about the jobs report What's your take on why stocks my, my, are reversing today? My, you know, so Josh brought up something before. Look, my background as a futures trader aligns to exactly what he's saying. The last 10 years has been about growth. It's about not being afraid to step in and buy stocks that are at the high. Okay, so you're talking about the recovery today. We are making a recovery in the market. Pull up Amazon, pull up Microsoft. Both stocks, all-time high. 
There's your story for today. Yes, you got a better unemployment report. Yes, there are still concerns about the coronavirus. Yes, the 10-year yield is trading at levels that make all of us uncomfortable. But it's about Amazon. It's about Microsoft. It's about the resiliency. I emphasized that a couple of days ago. I'm not afraid to buy Amazon right here approaching 2100. Microsoft, 185 post earnings. That's the story of the market. And you could extrapolate that further to Facebook, to Netflix, and to Apple. The story of this week has been the amazing gains that we've seen. NASDAQ's up better than 4%, Shan. Dow's up 3.5%, S&P, Russell, all right in line there with a gain of at least 3%. I, I, I think if you if think about what's happened with coronavirus and you think about a, a shift to safe haven assets, I actually feel like some of these mega cap U.S. companies, especially in the technology sector, are being seen as safer havens. Uh, if you go to treasuries, you go to the dollar, we've certainly seen flows there. But I think for, for U.S. investors who see this as, you know, for better or for worse, you know, I think we're, we're expecting this not to have a significant economic impact. And so they're looking at names that they feel comfortable with. And I think that's why we're seeing the flows of the names that have done really well over the last couple of years. How about the chips, okay? Great week. The semi-ETF, the SMH is up 6.5%. Remember, I mean, others have talked about it, but Josh highlighted it at least a week ago, maybe more saying that chips were the key to the market. Well, you got a recovery in chips, and not surprisingly, you got a big burst to the upside in the major averages. The Qs are up 5 the Qs are up five and a quarter percent this week. Uh, Microsoft is up nine percent this week. It's at a, it's at an all time high. Um, and yeah, I think like what the, what they've done with tech is they've ripped a lot of things out of it that we used to follow. We used to look at fangs and say, oh, this is tech. So what's left in tech is really like of of size. Like what moves technology in general is now two things: semiconductor software. They pulled out the Facebooks. They pulled out. All right. So now we say to ourselves, what could really drive a continued tech rally? Um, and you've already got stocks like Microsoft and the big software components at record highs. It's the volatility in the semis now that's determining from week to week whether we feel good or bad about, um, you know, the trend in technology stocks. This was a very good week. Let me give